Now, to add to the confusion, last time we also talked about something called the heat capacity. which I told you is just these two terms together, m times c. Mm -hmm. And to add to the confusion, I said that oftentimes the symbol for that is a capital C. You could use capital C for the heat capacity, and that would be m times little c for the specific heat. That maybe uh, that's a little confusing or unfortunate, though, because here we're using capital C for something else. This is not the heat capacity. Um, this is the molar specific heat. So that sometimes when people use a capital C, they're talking about the heat capacity. But sometimes when they use a capital C, they're talking about the molar specific heat. But you wouldn't usually use both of those in the same problem, so there shouldn't be too much confusion. Okay. One more way I, I think people get confused is I think they get the C's confused with the Q's. For example, when they see the word specific heat, they think that C just tells you Q. Well, no, there's a different, this is the actual heat exchange. This is just how much heat would be exchanged, again, in the case where you have one kilogram and one Kelvin. So you don't want to confuse Q and C. Well, now we can see why this equation makes sense. This tells us how much heat it would take to raise the one, one mole by one degree Kelvin. So if you multiply that by the number of moles and the number of degrees Kelvin, these two units on the bottom would cancel out, and it'll tell you how much heat it would take um, to raise that amount by a certain amount of temperature. What does the P here stand for? Well, this tells us that this is the specific heat that we use for a constant pressure process. Okay. Because other processes could have different specific heats. So this is the specific heat for a constant pressure process. So the full name for this is the molar specific heat at constant pressure. This is our molar specific heat at constant pressure. And again, uh, it's hard to show this on the board, but usually this is a capital C, <coughs> whereas the mass specific heat is a lowercase c. So now we know how to find the work that's done in an isobaric process and how to find the heat exchange. The other thermodynamic variable that, that you've seen is the delta U. Well, if, how, how would we find the delta U here? If we know the W and the Q, how would we find the delta U? Um, we would add Q and W. Or subtract depending on right. the work. Now here we're focusing on the work that's done by the system. So should we add that or subtract that to find delta U? Um, subtract it. That we shouldn't need to memorize. That should, be, that should make sense. If the system is doing work, it's going to lose energy. So that should be subtracted from its energy. So now we, if for an isobaric process, we could find W, Q, and we could also then find delta U using this formula. Okay. I'm putting this formula up here because this is always true, not just for the constant pressure process. Now, how would you figure out the molar specific heat? Now, we know that for the mass specific heat, you usually look it up in a table. Mm -hmm. However, for the molar specific heat, and I should have mentioned that for these processes, we're usually going to focus on ideal gases. Almost all the problems you would see for thermodynamics are about ideal gases. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out, um, so we know that different substances have different specific heats. However, ideal gases are all kind of the same as each other. They're all similar. So they should all have pretty much the same specific heats. Mm -hmm. So the way to find <coughs> this is, it just depends on whether we have a monatomic or a diatomic gas. The molar specific heat for a monatomic gas is just 3 halves R. And for a diatomic, it's five halves R. What's R? It's the same thing that we talked about last time. What do we usually use R for in this part of the course? I'm drawing Diatomic. This would be our universal gas constant, like from PV equals NRT. Oh, right. okay. So this is just our universal gas constant. So of course, we're using the idea here R comes up when we're dealing with ideal gases. So mm -hmm. 
So here, uh, I, I didn't put it on the board, but this is for a monatomic ideal gas, and this is for a diatomic ideal gas. Pretty much all the problems you're gonna see are gonna be about ideal gases, unless the, pro the, specific, the problem specifically tells you otherwise. On the exam, you probably only deal with ideal gases for this material. Make sure you that which So you don't need to be given a table, or you don't need to look up the molar specific heat. You just have in your cheat sheet. Yeah, so what they'll do is they'll tell you whether it's a monatomic or a diatomic gas, and then you automatically know what the molar specific heat is. Okay. And again, notice that the nice thing is, it's not like you need one specific heat for nitrogen, and another one for hydrogen, and another one for oxygen. As since they're all diatomic ideal gases, they would all have the same specific heat. So all that matters is monatomic or diatomic a gas. And then the difference between monatomic and diatomic, again? Oh, uh, yeah. Well, what do you think that is that difference here? We're talking about the, the molecules. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, we know that in the atmosphere there's a lot of oxygen, the oxygen we breathe. But the oxygen we breathe, we don't breathe oxygen atoms. Oxygen molecules are actually O2. Mm -hmm. All right. So a molecule of oxygen is actually O2, or a molecule of nitrogen is actually N2. However, um, a molecule of helium gas is just He. Helium is one of the inert noble gases. It doesn't form bonds to other heliums. So this would be monatomic, and these would be diatomic. Generally, I guess it's only the inert gases from the, the last column of the periodic table that would be monatomic. Okay. And most others are diatomic. Of course, there's also triatomic gases like carbon dioxide. And for those, they would have to give you what the, the molar specific heat was. These are the only two you'd be expected to know. Okay. I, I don't think you need to have this memorized for this class. But this is the mnemonic for all the diatomic molecules. All the diatomic molecules end in ene or gen. For example, chlorine. Some of these might be liquids, but anyway, chlorine, bromine, or um, hydrogen, or oxygen, or nitrogen. Okay. Whereas if it doesn't end in ene or gen, like helium, then it, uh, it's not diatomic. Okay. But I think uh, in your class, they'll just tell you whether it's monatomic or diatomic. Okay. Before I forget, something else to mention is that whenever we use a PV curve we're as, uh, to show a, a process that the gas is going through, we're assuming that we're dealing with a reversible process. These PV curves really only apply to reversible processes. We won't get into too much detail about exactly what a reversible process is. But roughly speaking, a reversible process is one that's always almost in equilibrium, or that where we're kind of pretending that it's in equilibrium. Uh, which means that if you made a very slight change, uh, what, I, what I mean is that the system is almost an equi is at, at every point, the system is almost in equilibrium with its surroundings. Which means that if you just made a very slight change, the, uh, the process could go in the opposite direction. Because it's almost in equilibrium with its surroundings, there's only a, uh, if you made a slight change, it could go in the other direction. That's where the term reversible is coming from. This is a reversible process is one that with a very slight change in the surroundings could have gone in the opposite direction. Well, it turns out that it doesn't make sense to graph the process for a non-reversible process on a PV graph. So whenever we're using uh, drawing the curve on a PV graph, we're assuming that it's reversible. Okay. Anything else? So let's move on to another type of process, a constant volume process. What would 
the graph look like for that? It would be a vertical line. Okay. Because now the volume isn't changing. Now the name for this is probably the least used. I don't know if you remember the name for the I, the constant volume. Yeah, it was like isochoric. Okay. I like knowing all these little names. Oh, you might yeah. not be tested on that one. Oh, all right, isochoric. I don't know where it's, I guess C-H-O-R means volume in Greek or Latin or something. But anyway, this is a constant volume process. So what can we say about the work that was done in this process? It's equal to zero. Good. How do you know that? Because there's no area under the curve between the line and That's a good way to think about it. The x yeah. We know the work is always the area under the PV curve. But there is no area under a vertical line because it has a width of zero. Anything with a width of zero has no area. 